Hello and welcome to tonight's event, Unsettling Narratives on Uncomfortable Oxford. I'm Amy Bug, Curator of Projects and Exhibitions at Modern Art Oxford, and also Curator of the current exhibition Between Making and Knowing Something by Mariana Casilla de Bourg, which explores the lives and work of four female anthropologists and indigenous makers connected to the Pitt Rivers Museum and Sassoni Institution collections through an installation of ceramics, textiles, photography and sound. I'm also pleased to introduce our guests, Paula Larson, Olivia Durand and Wakas Mirza from Uncomfortable Oxford, and to also explain the format for tonight's event. I invited Uncomfortable Oxford to lead a guided tour of Mariana's exhibition, as I believe their curious yet critical inquiry into the overlooked histories underpinning many of the institutions in the city really resonates with Mariana's work, which uses a variety of materials to explore the provenance of historical objects in order to consider how knowledge, history, and our understanding of the world is shaped by museum collections and displays. So we'd originally planned this event as a gallery based exhibition tour, but had to adapt the format due to the change in circumstances we find ourselves in this year. So tonight we're presenting a pre-recorded tour of the exhibition led by Uncomfortable Oxford. So we'll actually get to see the exhibition if you haven't been able to visit the gallery yet. The video tour will be screened in two parts. The first part runs for about 20 minutes, after which we'll stop for a brief chat and can take any questions. Then we'll watch the second part, which is around 15 minutes long, leaving hopefully enough time for a discussion and further questions at the end. So the event should finish at around 7.30 p.m. Please feel free to ask any questions during the event using the uh, Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and we'll pick them up in our conversation. So now to introduce our guests. Uncomfortable Oxford is an academic-led social enterprise in the city of Oxford, which runs walking tours, lectures, and digital events, highlighting histories of imperialism, slavery, inequality, race, class, and gender discrimination, as well as historical memory. Their goal is to raise awareness and generate uncomfortable discussions about these issues, using the built environment to bring up stories and examples from the past and their present legacies. So we're joined today by its executive team, Paula Wakas and Olivia, who you can see here. Um, and I'm gonna allow them to briefly introduce themselves before we watch part one. Well, hello, I'm Paula Larson, one of the co-directors for Uncomfortable Oxford. Uh, this was a wonderful project to work on. We really learned a lot from it. We're really looking forward to having you see it as well. Hello everybody, I'm Olivia Durant, co-director as well uh, of Uncomfortable Oxford. It was uh, really interesting to research uh, the origins and inspiration for this exhibition. We would have loved to give you the tour in person, but we are so really, really happy with the result and really excited to share it with you. Hello, my name is Vakas Mirza. I'm the executive secretary of Uncomfortable Oxford, and I'm really looking forward to hearing your questions after you've watched what we've uh, really enjoyed filming in the, in the galleries. So let the show begin. Great, thank you so much. We'll see you in about 20 minutes. Thanks. Welcome to the Unsettling Narratives Tour. This tour was designed by Uncomfortable Oxford, an organization in Oxford that seeks to combine research with discussion and critical analysis through public engagement. Today we're giving an Unsettling Narratives Tour, talking about academic narratives and the conversation brought forward by this exhibit between making and knowing something. Academic narratives are created by, historically, agents of empire. Individuals who went off across the world, collected objects, collected items, collected things, even flora and fauna, and brought it back into Western world where scientific labels were then placed on them. They were categorized by Western languages and were solidified by the discipline of anthropology, which eventually arose and created these arbitrary hierarchies of civilization. This creation of Western knowledge also displaced indigenous knowledge and it placed the anthropologist as the sole keeper of knowledge about different regions of the world and different cultures worldwide. But the other displacement that happened was also the displacement in meaning and purpose of the objects. You had household items, religious artifacts, and even pieces of clothing that were put on display within museums. And their meaning was very much circumscribed to labels and museum-generated descriptions. And in many ways, this removed them from their original context and meaning, while also removing them from the people and the environment that initially gave them meaning. 
So this story is also a story of silencing what those objects of use were originally meant to do and what they meant to the people who were originally using them. This exhibition between Making and Knowing by Mariana Castillo de Bal really questions the extent to which we can truly know something. And it also questions the extent to which an individual, external to the culture, can understand the making of it. By choosing to focus on female anthropologists, white and indigenous, Mariana Castillo de Bal has really woven these narratives into the displays in the museum. We will be walking you through the individual histories and unsettling the narratives that you are told during this exhibition. Matilda Cox Stevenson was a pioneering woman anthropologist who traveled to the southwest of the United States in the 1880s, and she devoted her life to the study of the Zuni indigenous nation. So now the, the Zuni reservation is in what we know as the state of New Mexico, but it used to encompass vaster territories, especially before the 16th and the 17th century when the Spanish came and there were many conflicts. During her early travels, Stevenson met Wewa, a Zuni Native American, who soon became her main informant. Wewa had a very powerful role within the Zuni group. They were a Nihamana. A Nihamana is a male-bodied person who takes on social and ceremonial roles that are normally performed by women within that group. Now, Wewa was also an exceptionally skilled potter, and Stevenson hired Wewa to produce pottery. And Wewa had a very good knowledge of all the religious protocols that were involved in the making of religious pottery specifically. In Stevenson's different accounts of her stays within the Zuni tribe, she describes how Wewa taught her and explained how to make those different potteries out of clay and the different religious, um, the re different religious obligations that came within the making of those potteries. And I'm going to read a part of an anecdote when she and her husband accompanied Wewa to a corn mountain nearby to obtain clay. On passing a stone heap, she picked up a small stone in her left band and spitting upon it, carried the band around her head and threw the stone over one shoulder upon the stone heap in order that her strength might not go from her when carrying the heavy load down the mesa. When she drew near to the clay bed, she indicated to Mr. Stevenson that he must remain behind as men never approached the spot. Proceeding a short distance, the party reached a point where Wewa requested the writer to remain perfectly quiet and not talk, saying, should we talk, my pottery would crack in the baking, and unless I pray constantly, the clay will not appear to me. She applied the hole vigorously to the hard soil, all the while murmuring prayers to Mother Earth. In 1886, Wewa was part of a Zuni delegation that traveled to Washington, D.C., invited by the Stevensons. During the time in Washington, Wewa actually produced different objects on site, and the whole process was documented by photographs by Stevenson herself. So this highlights a few different um, tensions. First, the question on the part of performance when being documented while producing something. And then secondly, there is the question of the, the value for the anthropological study when objects are produced specifically for museum collections. So if the object is produced with the goal of going into the museum collection, does it have the same anthropological value? So you can see those different pots behind me that are reproduction based on the clay pots that Wewa had produced um, both in the, among the Zumi tribe and also in Washington, D.C. Interestingly, when Wewa was in Washington, they refused to purchase the materials for their uh, production from the different stores that were available. 
they actually wanted to use the different items and materials that were already held within the collections of the local museum, the Smithsonian Museum. And in this way, this gives us an early example of co-curation when Wewa had the opportunity to arrange and give a certain context to the object that had been collected previously by the museum by reusing them to produce new objects to be held by the museum later on. This collaborative work is also replayed throughout their relationship with Stevenson throughout their life. It is a relational production of knowledge, which is also quite similar to co-curation practices of knowledge that we can see today. And in many ways, it shows that the production of knowledge is never completely um, disembodied from the, the object or subject of study. It is always relational. Now, many Zuni artifacts can be found in museums, both of archaeology and anthropology. And a great majority of them are still held within the Smithsonian today. Most of the potteries and weaving that were well produced for the Stevensons have been accessioned by the Smithsonian Museum. However, once they went into the collections of the museum, the name of Wewa was removed from the record and those became objects produced by anonymous artists of the Zuni tribe. This in some way demonstrates a tension within archaeology between, on the one hand, single authorship, having one artist producing a piece, um, an object or an artifact, such as in the case of those potteries uh, produced by um, the Baal. And on the other hand, you have the anonymity of the objects that are only related to one geographical area, one ethnic group, or one culture. In anthropology, putting objects into museums shows that the authors lose their connection with the objects that they have produced themselves, and they are absorbed within their own cultural group. So you've been given a history of Matilda Cox Stevenson and of Wewa and the collaborative anthropology and learning processes that went into their relationship um, and sadly been told about how Wewa's personal connections to their production and materials was lost over time as they were placed inside museums and as museums gained control of that narrative. But we want to now reflect on the actual exhibit itself, the exhibition here and think about the intent behind display in some form. So the intent behind the display of items. In the story of Wewa and the production of items for use within a museum, you have a really interesting tension between the production of the actual ceramics that Wewa created and the fact that they were done in a performative manner for academic, Western academic consumption and knowledge production. And they were done to be put on display within museum process, within a museum um, context. You don't necessarily have those items actually being used in their, their proper ritualistic way as actual items of use within the culture itself. And so that's an interesting tension. How many items do you think of in museums are actually were just made to be put there in lots of ways? Anthropology did that quite a bit. There was this production for placement in museums. And this exhibition is questioning that. Ugh the production of something, the making of something, and then the belief in the fact that you know it because it's been made for knowledge consumption. You can also see an interesting tension here with how the display of ceramics has been put on um, by Dibal. So you have ceramics that are also intentionally made for artistic display. These ceramics are not used as you know, holding pots for water or anything. They don't have an actual functional use. It's artistic use. And so it's really interesting to look at them and think about, well, how that artistic use is inscribed on them. One really interesting feature is, for instance, the kill hole you can see on most of these pots. A kill hole has been defined by archaeology as a hole that was placed within an actual ceramic pot um, in order to almost kill its function. It was usually included within burial ceremony of some sort. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the original ceramics were brought into the black market trade because as soon as archaeologists started to write about kill holes, um, many indigenous graves were looted for, for pots that had these kill holes in it. And yet you see here the kill hole is actually the thing that gives the life to these pots. The kill hole is what gives them the suspension, the, 
the ability to move, the ability to fly in a space, to be all over and take up spaces that they hadn't previously been able to take. And to, their function is, is life rather than death in the same way. So it's really interesting to reflect on those. And I really encourage you to take a moment now, look at some of these items, look at the patterns and the way they're displayed, and think about intent and how you see intent on their surface and how you've seen intent on surfaces within museums themselves, within the items you see in museums. How many times do you know if those items are actually prepared and produced just for that museum itself? So continuing on from that critique, I want to also draw your attention to the idea of combination of artifacts, which you actually see on display here. So you see a combination here of a pot that represents Zuni culture with the unfinished rebozo from the indigenous cultures within Mexico. And they've been combined in this display here. And it raises some interesting questions about the way we combine indigenous cultures in general across the Western world, across our understanding of them. How often do we actually define the distinctiveness of each individual culture? And how many times are individual cultures actually combined under larger umbrella terms? You know, the Native American Indian, indigenous people. But indigenous peoples, indigenous cultures are incredibly unique and distinctive things. And quite often they're combined into these really problematic larger groupings. And that happens in display quite often too. You can see it in the way in which textbooks handle histories, in the way in which textbooks and, and conversations within academic culture actually highlight different cultures. And even within policy, within Hollywood, you have a token indigenous person always in the movie. Within the way in which laws are coded, indigenous peoples are always a larger umbrella term. And in lots of narratives that we create, it erases the distinctiveness of those cultures and instead lumps them all into one whole. And we wanted to highlight that here. So if you look at this pot and the woven rebozo that comes from it, you're seeing combinations here. And how many of you would walk away and know right off the bat that those are two very individualized cultures that are combined into one? Or are they simply just often labeled as the indigenous ones? Something to take away with you as you walk through exhibitions worldwide is how much individualism actually comes out of it and how much do sections and our typologies by sections or our typologies by item, which you can see, for instance, in the Pitt Rivers, how much does that actually give you individual understandings of cultures and how much can you truly know them? So we're going to begin our tour a little bit further back into the exhibition in a side room and in this display here, which is a display of items and photographs collected by Elsie McDougall. Elsie McDougall was a female anthropologist who was born in 1883 in London. She would travel first to South Africa and then on to the United States. And during her lifetime, she became intensely interested in textile production. And she went on to do research and collection and study individuals and indigenous cultures across Guatemala and Mexico. Now she would go for long collection trips, these were labeled as, where she would take many photographs um, and she would watch something called the ECAT dyeing method of, of dyeing and weaving. So ECAT is a type of, of resist dyeing where you, you more or less would tie up sections you would like to have resist the color of a dye um, and then you'd set them in the dye and then when you untwist them, the, those areas would remain undyed and some would have colors. ECAT is specific in that you dye the strands themselves before you actually weave the fabric itself. And so it's different from like tie dye, for instance, which happens to a finished fabric. Um, ECAT happens to the actual strands, so it's incredibly artistically challenging to actually bring the different strands together to create the pattern in the end that you've created. So it's a really, really important technique and it, it takes a lot of practice and lots of learning. Now Elsie was very interested in the actual technique of dyeing, of specifically considering it to be a, a beginning to modern technologies of weaving, or in her time modern. And so she wanted to kind of very much in the traditional anthropological sense create these as the earliest techniques and see how progression occurred into later forms. Um, she was very fascinated with tools and with the actual practice of weaving and she took tons and tons of photographs. So if you look at some of the photographs that are on display in this section here, you see a focus on hands, on people in action, and most of the labels that were originally given for these displays when they were later put on display at the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford would be very technical labels, you know, like person weaving, um, 
this material, this object in use in some form. So it kind of, in lots of ways, reduced the activity of weaving and the cultural practice to just the labels. Um, and that's actually one of the reasons why, if you look at this exhibit, there are no labels. There's uh, essential numbers of the, photo of the photographs themselves, but the actual exhibit is, has removed those labels. So you can take away the information that you'd like to from this exhibit. What's also really interesting about how Dibal has put this display together is that she's utilized cases that you can actually t that were actually taken from the museum itself. So the Natural History Museum used to have these cases, and these cases and the way to display objects, these are quite historic cases. Oxford has had cases like these displaying objects like these for, for almost over a century. Some of them began in the Indian Institute, and then as new museums opened, those, those cases were moved out of places that were original kind of early museums into our modern museums. So the recycling of cases and therefore the recycling of display is a big part of the Oxford Museum heritage. She's used these cases themselves that are, are quite old in, in themselves and they're actually part of this exhibition for that, that reason. So when you look at these cases, you see photographs alongside tools. There's a photograph of McDougall herself, there's a photograph of people in the practice of weaving, and there was originally when these were put on display in the museums, they would have labels of the activity that was happening. And those labels told you very specific things. You know, man holding this tool doing this weaving practice. Woman doing this in this outfit. Very specific kind of generalized labels that, that really remove the people and the stories and the production of this culture. And that's what a museum exhibitions originally were for anthropology. Then you can see here for Dibal, she's actually removed all the labels on purpose. There are no labels. You can look at this and take away what you choose to take away. Our seeing a display like this also raises some interesting problematic aspects of anthropology and the way in which knowledge is, is known. And that's who was this knowledge produced for and who did it benefit? This is the cultural knowledge of individual groups of people who were studied by an anthropologist and extensively photographed, and those photographs were called collections. McDougall donated her collection of photographs and items to the Pitt Rivers Museum in 1948. And that collection is now known as the McDougall Collection. You know, this, this material is now the McDougall Collection, and that tells you a lot about how ownership of knowledge changes over time. So when you look at these photographs, what do you actually take away from them? What do you learn from them? What are the stories that are actually taken away? These objects and these images are carefully contained in these cases that you see here. But there's also something else happening in this room which is extremely interesting. If you look around, you'll see these newspapers plastered on the wall in a big contrast with the carefully and protected items that you have in these cases. And they really provide a sort of contemporary context to McDougal, McDougal's ethnography over here. It's a contemporary Mexican context that we have here provided on the wall. And so it really begs a few questions. Where did these newspapers come from? What were their purpose? Well, actually, they wrapped the objects which came for this exhibition and which we'll have a look at in the very next room in the main gallery. And they also raise a number of questions. They invite us to wonder what effect it has to have this embodied presence of newspapers in the room, of a context, of a contemporary context in this room. It also invites us to wonder, how does this affect our learning of the objects that we have in the room and our understanding of them? There are actually three different time frames in this room, if not even more. You have the images, the different objects, which are actually everyday and modern objects, which have been added to the case, the case itself, and the newspapers, which are very modern, but which also have a number of different temporalities and different aspects. 2020, but also 2014, all of these different time frames interwoven into one room. How do you think that affects our understanding of what's going on here and what we understand and learn from these objects and these items? So 
Uh, if I can welcome back uh, our comfortable Oxford and we're going to have a brief chat about what we've just seen. So I, I, what I really love about uh, the way that you've approached the tour is you bring so much of your own original research to the exhibition and you really uncovered things that even Marianne, Mariana and myself hadn't really even considered when we were planning it. And what's also so surprising is quite how quickly and totally independently you arrive exactly at the, the crux of Mariana's work, really. Um, which is thinking about the real problematics of display, the problems of museum collections and how we can communicate histories through objects. Um, so I wanted to just, I've got two questions prepared um, based on what we've just seen. And please, anyone else, feel free to put anything in the Q&A and we're happy to talk about that as well. Um, but my first question is, the whole, the whole exhibition is about anthropology as an emerging discipline. Uh, and it spans the late Victorian period to the mid 20th century, where the methods and ethics of anthropology are still developing. And almost all the figures that uh, are cited in the exhibition and Mariana has researched were working under periods of colonial rule in different parts of the world, almost at the same time as well. Um, I really love this, this last scene that we've just watched with Paula and Wakas in the in our, on our middle gallery talking about Elsie McDougall's collection. And this point that you that Paula touches on, which is the, the benefit of these anthropologists in their work. And this question of who is this knowledge produced for and who did it benefit? And that's something that I've just had in my mind and thinking a lot about. It's not something that actually this idea of benefit I'd really considered really in their work. So I wondered if I could push you to just say a bit more about that. How did you arrive at that question? But what exactly do you mean? I think, you know, in terms of the intention of the benefit of anthropological study and how might that consideration of maybe the ethics of their work, who is it for, what, what happens to this knowledge? Um, how might we understand the way in which these women in the exhibition are working um, through their field work? Yeah, I, I think it's a really fascinating question as well. And it's actually one of the most fundamental ones when it comes to modern anthropological practice. So I, I think the question itself, it didn't seem too much of a stretch. I have anthropology in my background as a training, but in, in modern anthropology, it's a paramount responsibility for any anthropologist to be considering what responsibilities they have to those they study. Uh, if there's conflicts of interest, um, if they've maintained anonymity as needed, uh, if the acquisition of materials and the transfer of materials based on a, a relationship of trust is ethical and how that trust is established. Um, and when it comes to this exhibit here, we're looking at a female anthropologist at the kind of early stages of anthropological collections. Elsie McDougall is, is collecting materials from people and giving them to Western academic minds and Western academic presentation. Um, in order to you know, benefit her own career, as well as to create a narrative of how textile production was continued over time. And she's very concerned with proving there is a pre-Columbian um, continuation of textile production. And so she's saying before the Europeans arrived, there was this textile production happening. And she's trying to justify that in lots of ways to her, to her academic community she's speaking to. But the only people who need to you know, justify that there was techniques that were very sophisticated and important is the European mindset. The, the individuals who have been making textiles in this area don't need to be proven that they have some sort of continuing legacy. And so it's the idea that producing knowledge, it's not being produced for them. And even still, when she collects these photographs, how many of those were sent back to the communities that they were taken from? Um, how many of her publications, which eventually came out after later, she, she did publish some, although she had to be pushed by her colleagues to do so. Um, how much of that information was, you know, read by the people she talked to or could have been read? Was it written in a language they accessed? And that's still a conversation in anthropology today. It's a, it's a big ethical tension about when an anthropologist is working with community. Is this, is their work benefiting that community first before, you know, the academics career themselves? And it's really, it's a, a really, uh, you know, there's a contentious discussion. Yeah, and an uh, uncomfortable aspect, I think, of her collection as well. We have a question from Catherine Clough, which is great. Thank you, Catherine, for sending it, uh, which I'm happy to ask. So what happens when removing labels also means removing names of people depicted in photographs, um, which I guess is what you're touching on as well, Paula. And how does the nature of photography um, also affect the readings we take from looking at photographs? I think we'll also come to on, onto this in the next, um, the next film, which touches on another collection, which, and Olivia gives a really great close reading of photography. But maybe this question of labels, removing labels was something I also wanted to ask um, in that, I just kind of scroll down to my notes. Often, 
often the labels reduce the narrative of an object to technical facts around how they were made. And this is a question I think, um, certainly kind of obscuring the history in this acts of erasure that happens through museum displays, which is something that Mariana's work constantly is looking at. But what is for me is, as well is, is a problem of how can we communicate meaning or knowledge without changing, changing or imposing knowledge on an object and also without obscuring some aspect of that historic the history um, around provenance and you know cultural difference I think. Um, I'll try to answer this one. It's quite a complex question and question of labels is something that we constantly think of because obviously there's the practical aspect of labels being supposed to be what's 30 words to explain something that's infinitely more complex and we see with the example of Wewa, uh, Wewa who who worked with uh, Matilda Cox Stevenson and went as uh, part of the delegation of the Zuni nation to Washington DC at the end of the 19th century and co-curated new artifacts that were acquired by the Smithsonian Museums and uh, Wewa created different pots on, uh, on the site that were then acquired by the museum. And we can see how Wewa's name actually has appeared from the record. It's not something that was present. And there's very much this tension that exists um, and that's very important in anthropology between what is considered art and what is considered to be an anthropological artifact. And quite often in, in anthropology, there is a very strong tendency to resume the individual to their kind of their community, their ethnic group, their geographical region. So the, the individual authorship disappears. And that's something that's that sometimes can be subverted when we actually know who is the who is the creator. But again, going back to, to the room with uh, Elsie McDougall's photographs, photography also kind of creates an extra um, intermediary, um, an extra boundary between, uh, between the knowledge uh, of the makers and the knowledge produced by the anthropologists, because the, the more the photographs are made, the more they are taken for the, um, like they're replacing the object and how we learn and how we teach most students today have only access to the photographs when they, when they start learning about anthropology, unless they go into further research later on, they'll only have access to those photographs. And those photographs, no matter about, no matter their, um, what historical value they have that they were taken in the 30s or they were taken at the end of the 19th century, as taken, are taken as this kind of thing that doesn't really have a temporality and that will give uh, a ready information about the different cultures that they're supposed to capture. And I think there's some, so we'll talk more about photography in, a, in, a, in the second half, but an important fact about photography in, at the turn of the 20th century is that it's really not something that happened in the way that we do it today. There were very long exposure time. It was very much staged. You couldn't just, you know, have your camera and click and take the photograph. It was a very different process and it it did engage the, the individual anthropologists and the different uh, creators, makers and different cultures uh, that were in front of the camera lens in a very different way. So I don't know if I fully answered the question, but I think I, I hope I've like tried to connect different points about this exhibition uh, together. Yeah, it's really useful. And actually rereading Kathleen's question, I just wanted to, it's, it's interesting to kind of expand on that because Mariana, well, it was a collective decision that we, there are no labels in the exhibition. We've listed the accession numbers of the items that are from Pitt Rivers collection, but we haven't um, added any descriptions for the images. Um, and that's intentional because we are treading a line between an art installation and something that is more museological. Um, and also just to add that in terms of the names of the people, the subjects in the photos, they're not featured in the catalog descriptions of the images. We, we found as much information as we could for the Pitt Rivers, the Pitt Rivers Museum catalog, but the, the data, as, as I think Paula mentions, is very factual. They're just describing, she's describing what the people are doing. She's not describing who, the, who any of those people are. There's men, women, and children, and they are, ne they are never named in her collection because her object is the work that they are doing. And so they're kind of these kind of anonymous figures. So that is a symptom, I think, of the way in which the collection has been produced. Um, so that's like a, an aspect of that in the exhibition. We've got um, another question here from Mayanka. By focusing 
on the intention of the maker, is there a danger of essentializing and reading too much meaning into objects produced within indigenous communities and thus ignoring other aspects um, like market sensibilities within communities, labor, materiality? So perhaps, yeah, are we, are, by thinking about who much about who made the objects, are we, yeah, maybe essentializing or perhaps even to an extent fetishizing a certain indigenous maker and that, that kind of position of who these cultural figures are as well? Yeah, I think, I think uh, this kind of ties in with the, the second question that you asked earlier on, as in, is it possible to narrate and to explain or to talk about an object more widely speaking without imposing meaning or without um, um, conditioning the meaning that is uh, subtracted from the explanation that you're giving, whether it be with labels or descriptive uh, elements of it, or simply the, the, the exhibition as a whole. And I think this is a very wide and general question, which is probably one of the biggest challenges which uh, museum collections, but also museum institutions as, as a sector generally are facing today, right? Uh, everyone is wondering how do we manage and deal with these labels? How do we uh, curate an exhibition? How do we say something about something without uh, saying too much, too little, without saying something wrong? Um, and, and I think it's important to acknowledge here that because you asked the question, is there a way to do it? And I think it's important to acknowledge that, you know, museums and, and, and heritage sector and these institutions in general are um, engaging and if not say, to say dealing with uh, a history uh, um, a, a, which, is, which is multiple centuries long. This is something which has been embedded both in practices but in thoughts as well in our societies, in our institutions um, and, and, and promoting a gaze over other cultures. And so it's the change or the ways in which we approach this is not going to happen overnight. Uh, and I think it's great to see that different institutions and different organizations are approaching this in many different ways. And I think that's the key. The key is to not try and have one solution to approach them, I think. It's to specifically diversify, to critically address these. And that's what Uncomfortable Oxford is doing. One of our main goals is always to diversify the narratives around whether it be an object or a part of a history or an exhibition as we have here. Uh, Olivia, did you want to add something? Uh, yes, uh, I was also thinking about kind of like how if we focus on authorship, we kind of forget about the objects being produced for like special specific religious rituals or for specific econo like economic exchanges and how it is actually also embedded in, in a geography and in, in, in a space. And I think there's the tension there because there is this knowledge which is quite important, which is sometimes recorded, sometimes not. And then as um, so my, my training is as a historian and I'm very much learning about how to deal with material culture. But one of the things that is really missing when we do historical research is the more we try to, to recover the stories and the voices of, of different groups that have been dismissed historically, the harder it is to find individual voices and indivi well, individuals, uh, individual names, which is why I think from, from my perspective, and obviously it is, not, it is not the perfect answer, it is quite valuable to try to think about authorship as well, if only to have a few individuals who would be named amongst the different, the different unique and diverse cultures that are um, represented in this exhibition, but also generally in anthropological museums worldwide. Brilliant. That's a great point to end on. We've got another 15 minutes of the next video to play. And thank you. I've got two questions here, but I'm going to pause them and we'll come back to them after this next uh, chapter. So I'm going to turn my video off and you can watch the next section. So we've made it to the third stop, which highlights another anthropologist. This one is highlighting the anthropologist Makareti, who is a Maori British anthropologist born in 1873, who died in Oxford in 1930. Makareti was born to a Maori mother, a British father, and she was born just one year after the end of the Maori Wars where the British colonial government established power in New Zealand. She was not actually named Makareti. Her, her birth name was Margaret Tom, but she took on the name Makareti, which was the indigenous version of her name, the Maori pronunciation for it. In the context of how Makareti grew up, indigenous people in New Zealand had lost control of their land after British colonial rule, and they had to turn to tourism instead for income. And so her actual village that she grew up in was a tourist destination for 
individuals to see what a native village would look like, and she took on this performative role as an indigenous tour guide. The early 20th century was an important moment for the development and dissemination of photography, but it was also a golden age for postcards. And those postcards were meant to be a, a snapshot that would symbolize different places, people and cultures all within one image. In her village, Makalati actually took upon her this symbolic role and most of the postcards that were printed there actually showed Makarati. So in those cases, we can see some of those post the postcards that were produced during her time when she was still living in her village and she was working in the tourism industry. And in her diary entries, we can see that she was very much in charge of the whole process. She was responsible for organizing the photograph settings and she was also overseeing the printing and the distribution of the postcards in the village and beyond. So now we have to kind of wonder how do these photographs sometimes follow and engage with tropes of colonial photography? Traditionally in colonial photography, you would have a costume or one artifact that would symbolically uh, signify the whole indigenous culture. And you can see that in quite a few of the postcards that are on display here. In addition, if you look at Makareti herself, she normally in daily life would have her hair tied up, but in all those photographs, she has her hair untied. And that, ver that very much engages with the tropes of the Polynesian women being uh, sexual or sexually available. If you take a look closer, you can also see quite a few pictures where you can see her arms or her ankles, which are supposed to also back this sort of trope. However, there are also signs in those different postcards that Makarati was very much in control of how she was represented. So first off, just at the practical level, she was the one who was ordering those postcards and she was the one deciding what the photographer was doing. Second, if you look at most of the photographs, she's actually looking back. She's not just submitted to the gaze of the white photographer, but she is looking back, she's gazing back at the onlooker. Finally, there are some very strong symbolic elements of power and of assertion in those photographs. So this portrait of Makarati is maybe one of the most famous portraits of her when she was still living in New Zealand. And you can see that she is wearing around her neck a Heitiki necklace, which is, which is a very uh, strong ancestral Maori symbol. And she also has on her hair a huya feather, which is a feather that would signify her own placement within a certain nobility in the, Maori, uh, in the Maori group. So in many ways, she challenges the um, idea that she is submitted to those photographs and to the expectations of the, of the colonial gaze. So this kind of begs the question, how are those postcards different from anthropological photographs, like the ones we have seen, for instance, in the case of Elsie McDougall, or, and in what way are they actually the same? Because at the time, most anthropological and colonial photographs were very much staged, and Makareti in those postcards is actually regaining a sense of power and agency over the way she is being represented, although, of course, within the limited discourses of the time. So when did Makareti become an anthropologist of Maori culture herself? In 1911, she went to Britain on a travel, and there she met the person she was going to marry, a gentleman, the landed farmer of Oxfordshire. She married him, and for a time, she actually retreated for, from public life, and it's only in the 1920s that we start seeing her again. She starts giving talks in public lectures, and she starts taking part in different cultural festivals representing Maori culture. Even though her initial desire was to have a private life, she stated that, 
I must try and not let them have the Maori misunderstood. Only for this reason did I join them. In 1922, she became an associated member of the Oxford Anthropology Society, and in 1926, she traveled back to New Zealand for a few months' visit. Uh, she went back to her village and actually spent an extended amount of time with the elder of the village. She was telling them about her project, her research project in anthropology, the study of her own community, and she was asking them for their blessing and understanding. In 1927, eventually, she enrolled as a student at the University of Oxford for a Bachelor in Anthropology. She's actually the second Maori student to study at Oxford University, and the first one was actually her son. The basis of her research was made of her own personal knowledge the oral traditions that she had been taught, and also the different interviews that she had conducted. Whenever she was living in England, she always made sure to have within her English house a room set apart to be a New Zealand room, as she called it. And she would work in this room, she would write in this room, and there would be different textiles and artifacts of Maori culture everywhere in that, uh, in that specific room. So you can see some pictures of the different Maori rooms that uh, Makareti had in England in this display case. And most of the artifacts that were within this room were thereafter donated to the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford and became themselves an object of study after having been initially an object of personal use. Makareti didn't have a very good health and she died two weeks before submitting her thesis. Her thesis was finally published a few years later, posthumously by her friend, Thomas Penniman. The title of the work was The Old Time Maori. So now, where does Makareti sit in this complex history between making and knowing things? Well, first off, she actually challenged a lot of the traditional anthropological views of the indigenous informer. Usually this indigenous informer was just seen as someone passive who was completely distinct from the expert scholar because they wouldn't have the skills to analyze and understand the culture and their items. Makareti became both. She was both the native informer and the expert scholar. And she also provided an insight into Maori culture from the viewpoint of the Maori as they saw themselves and not from the viewpoint of outsiders looking in. Secondly, she also wrote on topics that were usually ignored by her male counterparts. She wrote about childbirth, she wrote about placenta, she wrote about uh, periods and menopause, she wrote about childbearing, she wrote about marriage, and more widely about different protocols and rituals. And finally, what she also did in her work is that she chose to not say everything. She purposely decided to keep some topics secret. Her friend Penniman, the one who helped publish her uh, manuscript after her death, said that she wrote regularly to her people at home to make certain that they were willing to allow the publication of various facts or that the facts were exactly right which does show a certain care about the feelings and the, um, the rituals present within her own community and how some informations are not up for public display. In her own time, Makareti's work was largely dismissed as being autobiographical, and the people who dismissed her were mostly white anthropologists, mostly white settler, Pakea anthropologists from New Zealand. But today, her way of working, this sort of auto-ethnographical work, has, been, has gained a lot more recognition and has brought her back into public light and scholarly light as well. So having talked about different modes of display, modes of making, and the intent of the museum and anthropological display, we're going to wrap up thinking about the different ways forward and what other questions we can raise in this exhibition.
So we've made it to our fourth and final stop. And here we're going to be thinking a little bit more about display cases and the gaze. To start, we have a perfect object for this. Have a look at this. The display case that we have here is actually very similar to the other display cases that we've looked at during the exhibition. And all of these have been on loan from the Natural History Museum, and they were used first when it was opened in 1861. But as you can notice, this one is empty. And here, what Debal is doing is really playing, playing with the idea of displays and how they frame a narrative, how they frame historical information. And also what she's doing is highlighting that displays and objects and cases have an effect on the viewer. Actually, they transform the relationship between an object and a person. They, they, it transforms our relationship with objects. They transform objects into things. And so maybe we can have a, a little discussion over here and think about how this case actually impacts the relationship between the viewer and the object. What do you think? Oh, it's so interesting as a viewer because when I come to a case like this, I always expect to see something very important, something educational, something that I want to learn more about, usually like looking at a label of some sort. But you come here and go, what am I supposed to be looking at? It's interesting because the, this case is central to this room, so it looks like generally when you have at the center of the room is the most important thing and yet it's empty. So there's a sense of disappointment or maybe a sense of, or oh, maybe I came here at the wrong time. Like it is maybe the wrong time to come and the object hasn't arrived. So there's a certain deceived expectation. So that's really interesting. You pick up on the ideas of label and centrality and that really connects this object to all the other ones in the room. How does this case distinguish itself from the other cases? Well, something really specific about it is the height. And when you look at it, you're almost seeing your own reflection in a very interesting way. So you're looking at it, looking for an object, but when you don't see anything, you kind of focus on the glass itself. And suddenly I see my, myself, and it's reflecting back to me that maybe this is myself that's on display here. Yeah, especially if you think about the cases that are in this room, they are supposed to be, and also in the other rooms in this exhibition, they are supposed to, to encapsulate different cultures, other or the word cultures and are supposed to generate knowledge about them. So I kind of wonder what kind of knowledge does seeing my own reflection in this case, what kind of knowledge does it generate? Productions of objects or embodiment of cultures was very much part of anthropological science. Where do you think museums today actually sit in this between making and knowing? Well, there is a bit of a, of a change, right, initially when you would go to, uh, to museums a century ago, you would, uh, in an anthropology museum, you would be able to touch the items. Then those cases kind of became the norm and the objects were not available for the public anymore. Whatever you would learn would only come from visual cues or again, the labels, if they were actually available. And now we are kind of moving back to a more sensorial exper experience of the museum. Yeah, I also think this is a, a really good way in which this tells us, this display very specifically is telling us that you're not, you know, it was made for something, but the culture you're, you're here to know is actually our own. A museum is the culture that I'm looking at. The Western culture is the one that's on display here. And that's, I think, what's really, I think really important for, for any, someone to listen, to look at, and to also like when critically analyzing all these displays, the, the takeaway of what is actually known is more about ourselves perhaps than about other cultures that, that we've seek to define and label over time. And so broadening this discussion about production, consumption to the exhibition as a whole, tying it with ideas around anthropology, the question of authorship is really central to this exhibition more generally. So how do you think that this exhibition challenges or unsettles narratives of anthropology? I really think this exhibition is a good job about problematizing not just labels and display, but also that idea of gaze and how gaze has been used in the past to create power, how gaze can be refuted or, or inverted in some way. Um, and it's an uncomfortable thing, but when you look at an empty space to think maybe that is actually a better, a better display, this empty one, maybe those artifacts shouldn't be here. 
or shouldn't be in storage. And it kind of pulls out a little bit of a hint here about conversations repatriation, which are the ongoing, ongoing discussions. And I think it's quite powerful to also have this discussion about museums and anthropology in Oxford, because this idea of museum is very Western centric. The first public museum was opened in Oxford and this kind of framing within cases of objects of other cultures of cultures that are not the local cultures that are from different countries, from different traditions and religion is something that was very much born here. And it's a very interesting reflection to, to think about how we know things and why we know them and what are the expectations created by those cases and those modes of displays that we take for granted. So this concludes the unsettling narratives tour from Uncomfortable Oxford. Thank you very much for joining. Modern Art Oxford has developed a 360 version of this exhibition and we will continue working with them to embed some of the questions we raised today within the 360 exhibition. And if you're interested in joining other uncomfortable conversations about the past, about the present, join us on our website, uncomfortableoxford.com. Great. So if I could welcome the group back again, we're just gonna have um, a short chat um, about the second part of the tour. I realize it's 7.30, so hopefully we won't carry on for too much longer, maybe 10 more minutes, and please do ask any other questions that you have. Um, I've got one that ties into a question from Rebecca Pelly Fry, actually, and maybe I'll kick off with that, is um, this figure of the indigenous informant, which is both Makareti, but also Wewa, who both were considered to be informants and take on that role. Um, I wondered if you could say more about how these indigenous figures operated in, the, in terms of the development of anthropology. Um, their influence on museum collections, I think, is still significantly under-recognized, um, but also their work extended beyond the museum. They're both, that both of them, to a certain extent, were seen as ambassadors, or, or Wewa was considered to be involved in acts of diplomacy uh, in Zulu culture. So could, are you able to say a bit more about how they, these figures managed to um, develop both the discourse, but navigate very sensitive areas um, personally, but also professionally. Yeah, I do I want to pull on the idea of, of the informant as a very controversial one today in anthropology, actually, because um, indigenous informant as a label, or just in general, a cultural informant, seems it seems to place individuals who are part of the culture that's being studied in an anthropological sense outside of the production of knowledge, they inform you of it and you create that knowledge yourself. And so historically that's that's a term that was used, but it's it does overlook the crucial role that individuals as part of this culture have in the mutual creation of knowledge, in the shaping of knowledge, in the shaping of interpretation. And today in the fact that most individuals could easily be part of the writing, the publication of these um, these knowledges and the, the way in which a study, an ethnographic study comes forward. So there, there should be, the concept of informant has hopefully been discovered or discarded more recently in anthropology, um, but historically has had this coercive aspect in that it feels like an anthropologist which has no connection to a culture is able to go and find significant actors within that culture to be labeled as their informants um, and pay them or have some sort of relationship with them that could be more coercive or more mutually beneficial and uh, like get them to give the information that it is sought after for the anthropologist sense. Now the idea of Wewa and Makarati I think challenged this concept quite a bit because it's very problematic to look back on the past and say that informants were, were kind of powerless victims in these situations. Um, for instance, Wewa had a very thriving business as a uh, first a laundry doer in, in lots of the different missions around the sites where the Zuni uh, culture, they had missions nearby and they found great employment and, and not only that, but they made a business out of getting employment um, and out of, you know, working with Stevenson. So there was a lot of financial benefit that Weibo was able to gain from this. And uh, Macaretti, again, is as a person who's within culture gaining some sort of benefit from the study is that has been done on her own cultures and being part and participating in the sale of postcards, for instance, the production of those photographs. She had the power to create them, the power to stage them as she chose, and she gained, and her, her community gained from that in the ways that she was able to manage. So the agency of the informant is often what's really overlooked here. And I, I, it's really disingenuous, I think, to, to kind of consider them to be just, you know, naive victims in some way, but they're, they're individuals with complex actions that act within the frameworks of society that they find themselves in. And they act to their own benefit as they can, 
and that doesn't always work out to their own benefit. Um, but Wewa was able to create quite, uh, even though her, her label or the label of Wewa, their label was lost through time um, in the moments of, of contact with uh, the, the Smithsonian production that was going on, um, they negotiate a lot of those terms and that's really important uh, to look back and then to see how it's our system of knowledge production and keeping and, and display that has erased that, that agency of Wewa. That was where the agency was lost. It was not, not lost at the beginning so much as in the, the way we've maintained our, our collections um, and the way we, we labeled our photographs within museum settings. I don't know if Olivia wants Oh, I was going to say, Olivia makes the great point that uh, Macaretti actually chose to conceal, you know, she was controlling the distribution of her cultural knowledge, really, of, of Bowery people, because she was choosing what to disclose and what not, some things she wasn't prepared to share. Um, whereas Awewa had this contentious relationship with Matilda Cox Stevenson, because Stevenson went on and documented um, spiritual religious ceremonies which is hugely insensitive to Sunni culture as well so I think it's interesting I'm just I'm wondering as well to what extent there was a gender dynamic to the way that these two figures worked as the in the in the role of an informant of a kind of a mediator between like western academics and researchers and yeah. oh, sorry <laughs> you want to go and that definitely was uh a very complex relationship and so it's something we don't mention as in the tour because it's not present in the exhibition um, when we talk about Matilda Cos Stevenson we talk about uh, her relation to Fuewa and also the, the pottery making but Matilda Cox Stevenson was quite a pioneer in the usage of photography as well so she took many photographs uh, about 900 of them over many over next several decades working uh, with the Zuni nation uh, again trying to recontextualize that photographs took a lot of time to be made. So it's not 900 is actually a very large number. And uh, there were lots of issues whenever she was, she was fascinated by, by uh, religious rituals and she was taking pictures. And that, that was obviously a very big problem. She also documented a lot of the kind of the, the, the manufacturing of the pots, the weaving. And um, the one thing that's interesting when we I'm trying to connect the different points in the, in the exhibition. So you have Cox Stevenson took lots of photographs, but they were actually not intended for publication. She just used them over different journeys to kind of look at them and see what has changed over time, which was also quite interesting because she wasn't necessarily essentializing what she was seeing. She was actually seeing change over time and what's the contact between the missionaries and the Zuni nation was, was doing to, to the Zuni culture. And those were not necessarily, she wasn't using them for the, her publications and they were massively used after her death by other colleagues. So that's like a difference with Elsie McDougall in many ways where Elsie McDougall works a little bit later, a few decades later and photography is a lot more uh, important. And in the case of Macaretti, so it talks about how she was also an intermediary and the fact that she was, so her mother was, was uh, was Maori, but her father was was British, a British man. So she benefited from both um, educations, and she learned a lot of the inside knowledge of the the Maori. She was actually raised by her aunt and uncle uh, on her mother's side, but she did know both cultures, and in in some ways that also helps her understand what were kind of the expectations. So she kind of, in a way, she was very conscious of how she was presenting herself and how it was very much a performance, but she was very much using that to her own advantage, first as a guide, and I really like talking about how she, she used guiding as a way to, to regain agency, obviously we're all guides, so we enjoy guiding, and for her it was very much a way of saying, oh you white visitors coming to my village, well now you're a visitor and in my culture we accept visitors, so it's okay to guide you around, we, we control what is happening, and then on the other hand she was kind of, she was she was on both sides of this kind of um, knowledge production because she had the knowledge, but she was also trying to shape it in a way that was expected by the visitors, but also that would protect her own community. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's really, she's just a fascinating figure and was a huge surprise for us to find, um, had such a strong connection to Oxford. I'm conscious of time, so I've got one final point just to 
um, just to kind of ask really all of you, I really enjoyed your conversation at the end around the empty vitrine, which is incredibly intentional and takes up a huge amount of space. And there's this very um, curious presence, I think, in the room. And I, I really like hearing you speculate on what that object does and maybe also what the future of museum displays might be. And something that um, I think Olivia mentions is perhaps you can see it moving, perhaps we are now moving back to a more sensorial experience of the museum by kind of eschewing these kind of preservation of objects in displays and, and looking towards more tactile ways of understanding. Um, I wonder if you could just say perhaps more on that uh, as a closing um, point. Yeah, we we really did enjoy that uh, that specific installation as well because, as you say, it 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 really it forces you to engage with it on many different levels and with many different senses. And I think what we meant there is that pretty much roughly since the late twentieth century, museums have really uh, shifted their focus from researching, collecting, and preserving objects to uh, really developing an interest in the experience that visitors have in a museum. And so today's museums are, are focused on engaging connections between visitors and collections. And this has encouraged them to not only consider the uh, intellectual connection that a visitor may have with a, with a museum object or a collection, but also an emotional one or a physical one. And this is when uh, multiple senses, so uh, the, the sensorial experience of a visitor comes in because you realize that uh, sight is not the only way you can interact with these objects and so hearing, uh, smell, taste, touch, all of these different senses kind of uh, come together and this is why again this specific installation with its occupation of space forcing people to walk around, engage with each other maybe, engage with themselves when, when what you see is not the object but, what, but what's on the other side, um, but also hearing because there's this audio piece which is triggered uh, where you hear the voice of the artist. And so I think what this is doing again is diversifying narratives, multiplying narratives, multiplying stories which speak about an object. And again, I'm coming back to what I said earlier on, that is key in, in, in our experience of a museum. I think that, you know, there's this popular saying, which is there's always two sides to a story, right? Well, that's a great saying, but it's only a beginning. There are many, many more sides to a story and I think it's important for us, but for museums in general, to tell as many sides as possible when they're when they're curating their exhibitions. Wonderful. That's a really yeah beautiful point to end on. And I yeah thank you for also pointing out that the vitrine it is an artwork really as well. There is also a sound piece which um, you can come if you come to the gallery um, when we reopen. We're open onto the seventeenth of January. You can hear it as well. I will also get the recording online. Um, thank you all so much for your very, very generous tour of the exhibition and for taking time this evening to talk us through it. And um, yeah, please do come to the gallery um, when we're open very, very soon and seek out Uncomfortable Oxford's tours because you're very active and have lots of brilliant things going on. So I do recommend them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us. It was wonderful to be here. Um, and obviously this is a really, really fascinating tour to unsettle hopefully some of those narratives that are traditionally told. Uh, thank you so much. And yeah, we look forward to going back to the museum whenever it reopens. So thanks for making this tour possible in, in some sort. Thanks to everyone for tuning in as well. Great. And also thanks to Anya Fox, who is behind the scenes doing tech, and Andre Latham, who made it all possible tonight. Thank you. And we'll see you very soon.